Good okay. evening, everyone. I'm Lorraine Malfa, Programming Coordinator for Loudoun County Public Library, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program, Return of the Periodical Cicadas. Please feel free to use the chat box to send me any questions or comments you have during the program, and I can relay them to our speaker during his presentation. It's an honor to have with us tonight Michael Raup, a professor emeritus and fellow of the Entomological Society of America. Mike is a regular guest on NPR, was featured on National Geographic and the Science Channel, and has appeared with media luminaries included Jay Leno, Dr. Oz, and Kojo Namdi. Mike's Bug of the Week website and YouTube channel reach thousands of viewers weekly in more than 200 countries. His most recent book, 26 Things That Bug Me, introduces youngsters to the wonders of insects and natural history, while managing insect and mites on woody landscape plants is a standard for the arboricultural industry. So we're so excited to hear about cicadas, Mike. Oh Thanks my gosh. for joining us tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lorraine, and uh, thank you folks for inviting me into your homes this evening uh, to tell you a few bug stories. So, uh, I've already had several phone calls this year and several emails from people as far away as California knowing when they should come to Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Northern Virginia to witness the brood 10 periodical cicadas. So get ready. The tourists will not be looking at the Washington monuments. They will be looking at things like cicadas and they're just around the corner. So with that, let's dive in and talk a little bit about what we'll see over the next two months. I want to take you on a little historical journey first. I'm going to take you back to 1633 to the second governor of the Massachusetts colony, William Bradford. Here's what William Bradford had to say about periodical cicadas. All the month of May, there was such a quantity of a great sort of flies, like for bigness to wasps or bumblebees, which came out of holes in the ground and ate green things and made such a constant yelling noise as made all the woods ring of them and ready to deaf the hearers. Well, you can tell even back in 1633 that our politicians were prone to hyperbole. It's really not going to be that bad. The next published account I could find was by Henry Oldenburg in 1666 in the Proceedings of the Royal Society, who wrote, A great observer who hath long lived in New England did once upon one occasion relate to a friend of his in London where he lately was that some few years since there was such a swarm of a certain sort of insects in that English colony that for the space of 200 miles, they poisoned and destroyed all the trees in that country. There being found innumerable little holes in the ground out of which those insects broke forth in the form of maggots, which turned into flies that had a tail or sting which they struck into the tree and thereby envenomed and killed it. It's not going to be that bad either. A little bit closer to home, an anonymous writer from uh, St. Mary's County, Maryland, what is now St. Mary's County, the original uh, capital of Maryland, wrote in the Annapolis, Maryland Gazette in 1751. We are informed in some places the locusts have been found in great plenty just under the surface of the earth, almost at their full growth. May God avert our impending calamities. So, there they are. They've arrived in a new world, escaping religious persecution in Europe. They get here, they start to plow their fields, and OMG, they're underground, are millions of these creatures. It feels like you're back in Egypt, and this is the, the eighth plague, so the plague of locusts. And I think this is related to the early um, description of periodical cicadas as locusts. 
a tradition that still maintains itself to this very day. I'm still trying to convince many journalists that uh, periodical cicadas are not locusts. Locusts are grasshoppers. Periodical cicadas are much more closely related to aphids. They have sucking mouth parts and they feed on plant sap. Locusts, as you know, will reach tremendous numbers in sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Asia, where they'll swarm and devour everything in sight. So there's been a little bit of a misconception that persists to this day. So let's then talk about periodical cicadas and some of their relatives, the dog day cicada. Now, people will say to me, what's the big deal? Don't we see cicadas every year? Well, sure we do. But the cicadas we see every year are what we call annual or dog day cicadas. They develop two to eight years underground, and some adults emerge every year, usually toward the end of June, July, August, September. They're greenish in color. They have bands to break up their body outlines, and their strategy for survival is what I call stealth and speed. They're very difficult to find on trees. They blend in, and if you do locate them and try to approach one, they're gonna take off like F-16s. They fly very, very fast. The periodical cicada, on the other hand, they're going to take 13 or 17 years to develop underground. It is believed that they are the longest lived insect in their immature or juvenile stage. It turns out they're not the longest lived insect. That record goes to termite queens, which can live more than 50 years. They are going to emerge in mass in tremendous numbers, as many as 1.5 million per acre. They appear in mid-May and into the month of June. They have beautiful red eyes, jet black bodies with orange wings, and their strategy for survival is one of the most bizarre of any creature on planet Earth. It is called predator satiation. What that means is they are going to emerge simultaneously in such vast numbers that they are going to fill the bellies of every predator that wants to eat them, and there's still going to be enough left over to perpetuate their species. This is crazy, but hey, it's worked for millions of years for periodical cicadas. Some people think it's only one species of cicada that will be emerging. There are actually three species of 17-year cicadas. The largest is what we call Magicicada septemdecim. The two smaller species are Magicicada cassini and septendecula. We can differentiate these by their body size, their body colors, the songs that they sing, their habitat preferences. Septendecim likes upland habitats. Cassini is more likely to be found in floodplains and lowlands. And of course, by genetic analysis, we can differentiate them. But perhaps most characteristic of the cicadas are their unique songs. Let's listen to a couple. You make sure the volume's up. Here we go. Let me see if I can raise the volume for just a, well, we'll, we'll proceed this way. That was septemdecim. Here's Cass and I. And here in our region, the least common is what we call septendecula. This one is more common in the south. It sounds a little bit like a Katie did to me. Hey, Michael, we didn't hear the first two for some reason. The third right. one came clear. Can you try it one more time? Let me try this. I'm going to try to raise my speaker volume okay. here. And everybody and, who's listening, maybe raise your speakers too. 
Now, here we go. I'm going to blast you out of here. Thanks, Lorraine. <laughs> here we, here we, get ready. Here, here we go, uh -oh. gang. Put, put your earplugs in. That's septem decim. Here's Cass and I. This is my favorite. I like this little cicada. Sounds like a short circuiting high tension wire. And here's septem decula. Sounds like a Katie did. Better on the audio? Yeah. Did folks hear that? Do you still hear me? Lorraine, are you there? Yep, I'm sorry. Yes, we heard that one. Thank you. Yep, that was great. Thank you. Okay, all good. The uh, 13 year cicadas have four species. And again, we can differentiate those by their size, by their color, by their songs, by their habitat preferences, and of course, by genetic analysis. Now, people will often ask, what is a brood of cicadas? A brood simply means that in a relatively well-defined geographic region, the cicadas that emerge synchronously at intervals of 13 or 17 years. So it's a well-defined geographical vast emergence of periodical cicadas in those uh, 13 or 17 years. There are actually 15 broods of cicadas total. We have 12 broods of 17-year cicadas and three broods of 13-year cicadas. We keep track of these. The early cicada researchers uh, gave them Roman numerals to differentiate between the various broods. It just so turns out that brood 10 is also known as brood X, as in X files, extreme, extra special, which kind of makes it even more mysterious. There are two broods, brood 11, which used to be up here in Connecticut, and brood 21 down here in Florida, which have gone extinct in recorded history. In our particular region, including Northern Virginia, you'll actually have one more than we do here in Maryland. You'll have brood one, brood two, you will have uh, brood five, of course, brood 10. You're also gonna have, uh, share with us brood 14 and brood 13. So again, many, many different cicadas. At any given year, in some place in the country, there is a brood of cicadas emerging. Some people think it's only 13 or 17. No, there are different broods emerging in different locations almost any year in the eastern half of the United States. This is the only place on planet Earth where this takes place. There are other periodical cicadas uh, there's a brood of uh, cicadas in Fiji, another one uh, near India, but these emerge only on four and eight year time cycles, not 17 or 13. So this is the only place where this happens. Now, brood 10 is special because it's going to be one of the most widely distributed broods. It is gonna emerge, and let me switch graphics here. In Georgia, there'll be a big cluster, Tennessee, in our region, going from Northern Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Maryland, in a band up through New Jersey to Long Island, and another big cluster out near the Mississippi and Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. So this is one of the largest broods uh, of periodical cicadas anywhere. The other piece that makes this special, of course, is you're simply going to have billions, if not trillions of periodical cicadas interacting with tens of millions of human beings in the greater metropolitan areas here on the East Coast. And that's part of what makes this 
Very interesting. How old are cicadas? Well, we know the ancestors of cicadas were about sometime about 5 million years ago. At about 3.9 million years ago, the clan split into the Decim group and the Cassini Decula group. This branch of the evolutionary tree then split once again into Decula's and Cassini's about 2.5 million years ago. But the 15 extant broods that we have today is relatively recent. This only took place in the last 500,000 years, off and on during periods of glaciation here in North America. What controls the plasticity or the basically the formation of these different broods physiologically, genetically is not unknown. We'll talk a little bit more about some hypotheses about how these broods evolved in just a moment. Why did we see cicadas unexpectedly in 2017 and 2020? In almost every brood of periodical cicadas, including brood 10, there are certain members of the brood that emerge either four years early, four years late, or one year early or late. These ones are called stragglers. Periodical cicadas are time travelers, and they make common jumps of four years. So the cicadas we saw here where I live in Columbia, Maryland, in 2017, we had a whole bunch of brood 10 cicadas up and out of the ground. What we believe has happened to create the 15 extant broods is they've made time jumps. So if you can imagine brood 14 cicadas making a four year time jump, they create brood 10. Brood 10 makes a four year time jump, creating brood four. Brood four makes a four year time jump, making brood two. And a single year time jump at any point would create something like a brood three or a brood one. And we believe that it's this time jumping that cicadas do that have created the various broods we see this day. I want now to talk about synchrony, their long life cycles, and prime numbers. Now, all creatures on planet Earth have to synchronize, right? Hey, if you come out one year uh, too early and you're a guy, and the girls are showing up one year later, you're in trouble. It's simply not going to work. So synchrony has to happen in order for you to find mates. Now, for their bizarre strategy to work, they must emerge simultaneously to overwhelm their predators, correct? So if they emerge one year early, they're going to be eaten into oblivion. If they emerge one or two years late, perhaps they are eaten into oblivion if they don't emerge in massive numbers. It's a safety in numbers game. The proof of concept was done by one of the early cicada researchers, a scientist named Marlet. He's the one that created the Roman numeric system for identifying the broods. He wanted to establish periodical cicadas on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. in the late 1800s. So he brought thousands of cicada eggs to the National Mall, released them in front of the USDA building under a big tree. And sure enough, 17 years later, they emerged right on time. However, the birds on the National Mall swooped in, ate every single cicada into oblivion, oblivion proof of concept that if you don't create the massive numbers, you cannot succeed. Why the long life cycle? How does this happen? Well, understand that the Earth is a big geothermal sink. If you go two feet down in the soil, it's, it's usually in the 50 degrees. It doesn't matter what your ambient temperatures are. So because insect development is related to temperature, they're basically growing or living in a cool environment. The other piece of this puzzle, or another piece of the puzzle, is the fact they feed on a nutrient-poor tissue. Trees have various vascular tissues, one of which is called xylem. Xylem tissue transports water, 
amino acids and minerals to the canopy of the tree where photosynthesis happens. Leaves are very nutrient rich. Phloem tissue, which carries the products of photosynthesis back down to the roots, is very rich. But xylem tissue tends to be nutrient poor. They're feeding on a poor quality food source, so maybe this causes their life to be extended because it simply takes them longer. A third possibility is size matters. Now think about it. If you want to overwhelm your predators, the way you do this is to have lots of progeny. If you're an insect, how do you do that? You grow very large because the larger the insect is, the more eggs it can lay. So perhaps it simply takes longer to achieve a large body size to produce all the eggs that are necessary. I've mentioned that many of these broods evolved during ice ages as ice sheets moved up and down the Appalachian Mountains and throughout North America. There's a hypothesis that stochastic events, random events may simply eliminate, extirpate populations with greater frequency if generation times are short rather than long generation times, a random event is less likely to basically exterminate a nascent brood of cicadas. Here's my favorite hypothesis, however, regarding long life cycles. I'm going to take you back now to your uh, college biology course. I teach non-majors bio and we talk about predator and prey. You'll remember that prey populations rise and then the predators come in, in and they eat the prey and their populations rise. And then the prey population crashes and then the predator population crashes and then the prey population builds and the predators build and then the prey crash and the predators crash. And then the prey population builds again and the predators track them in time, right? So we have these predator prey cycles of boom and bust where the predators are tracking the prey. Now let's imagine the lifetime of something like a sparrow or a cardinal or a raccoon or a squirrel or anything that else that wants to eat a cicada. Can a sparrow wait 13 years till the next crop of cicadas appear or 17 years? I don't think so. I don't think a, a squirrel can do that. And I don't think a raccoon does that either. So by, by having a very long life cycle, it makes it incredibly difficult for any particular predator to specialize on them and track them in time. Another proof of concept. You may be familiar with cicada killer wasps. I am because I have several nesting sites for these things in my lawn and flower beds. What the cicada killer wasp will do is it will build a gallery in my flower bed. It will tunnel down and create chambers. After the chambers are created, after the galleries are complete, the cicada killer wasp will emerge and it will fly into the treetops to hunt dog day cicadas, annual cicadas that emerge and appear every single year. Once it finds a cicada, it will sting it and paralyze it. It will bring it back to its gallery and stuff it into the ground. The cicada is undead. It is simply paralyzed. The cicada killer wasp will then lay an egg on the cicada, the egg will hatch, and the young cicada killer wasp will devour the cicada. Now here's something that's really cool. I mean, that's pretty cool. This is really cool. The female cicada killer wasp is about twice the size of the male. If she wants to have a daughter, she will catch three, two or three cicadas, paralyze them and put them in the hole and then lay a female egg because it's going to take two or three cicadas to make a daughter. If she wants to have a son, she will catch one or two cicadas, put them in the hole because the male cicada killer wasp is half the size of the female and it only takes one or two. They have the ultimate in gender control. That's pretty cool. I know, you know, to have a son and daughter took me a couple tries, but hey, 
they can do it just like that. Proof of concept that if your prey are predictable, if they come up every year, you can track them and you can specialize on them. This is something you cannot do with something that appears only 13 or 17 years. Why prime numbers? Well, as you know, prime numbers are only divisible by themselves in one. The clever mathematical modelers have created models where we have interacting predator and prey, random mutations in prey incubation time, in other words, the number of years a cicada would take to develop, and predator starvation time, the number of time intervals or years it would take for predators to starve to death. When they run the model, what they learn is the predators basically tank at year nine, they're gone, However, the periodical cicadas are still chugging along in prime number years of 11, 13, 17, and 19. Well, that one's a little bit above my pay grade, but here's one that I think might be a little bit more easily understood. Let's suppose in a given location that we have periodical cicadas that emerge every two years or four years two different broods. That means that every two years, they are merging simultaneously and interbreeding. Now let's imagine that the hybrids, right? The hybrids could be emerging in year one, two, three, or four. So we're going to create hybrids that are emerging over broader period of times. What that does, as Fauci would say, is it flattens the curve, increasing the distribution in time, but shrinking that massive emergence they depend on. So if there are hybrids, the predators may simply eat them into oblivion. There may not be enough to emerge simultaneously to overwhelm the predators. Now, because they emerge only in years, prime number years 13 and 17, they will emerge sometimes simultaneously, but it only happens once every 221 years. Kind of cool. How do they know? They've been underground for 17 years, living a COVID-like existence. It's dark down there. There aren't any visual cues. They're social distancing, trying to space out so they don't compete with each other. It's got to be dreary under there. How do they know? Well, remember what I said. I said they feed on the xylem fluid of plants, deciduous trees. Now let's think about this for a minute. In the winter time, deciduous trees have no leaves. So there is no xylem that's flowing up to those leaves. But this time of year, when the leaves put out, when the trees put out their leaves and photosynthesis happens, the trees begin to draw water and minerals up through the xylem. So if you look over the course of a year, there'll be times when xylem pressure and flow increases, and then in the fall it decreases. Spring it increases and then decreases. So perhaps periodical cicadas are able to track the annual fluxes of xylem flow, plant hormones, or nutrients. So they're simply underground counting one, two, three, 14, 15, 16, 17. Another possibility is there's a yet unknown molecular clock that simply ticks off those years for cicadas. We all have circadian rhythms, rhythms that vary at, during the 24 hour cycle. I know I wake up at 5.30 every morning. It doesn't matter what time I've set my alarm clock to, that's when I wake up. So molecular clocks, could be tracking fluxes with nutrients in their plants. These are two hypotheses about how they keep long-term time. What are we going to see, or what are we going to see, what is happening right now in the world of the periodical cicada? Well, I first began to get phone calls back in March about raccoons excavating people's lawns, digging holes, I then looked out in my backyard and I found the fox 
digging a 30 foot long trench underneath my trees to expose cicada nymphs. They have excellent noses that can smell the cicadas. I had a report of a golden retriever digging up somebody's yard to eat cicadas. Right now, if you think you have cicadas or if you had them back in 2004, you can go out underneath your trees and brush away the leaves and what you're going to see are the exit holes of the periodical cicadas. So a month or more after they're going to make the jailbreak from the earth, they'll create their exit galleries or exit holes. Sometimes they will put little mud caps called mud turrets over the top. We don't know whether that keeps out predators or keeps out rain. We usually see these more in wet areas or right after rainfall. And if you go out in your garden right now and lift up a, a walking stone, a garden slate or something like that, don't be surprised to see periodical cicadas building their galleries as they try to work their way to the edge. There will be vast numbers of periodical cicadas. This is one square foot in my backyard under my maple tree. There are 30 holes per square foot. That translates into about 1.2 or 1.3 million cicadas per acre. A lot of cicadas are coming out of the ground. The short term cue they use is a soil temperature of 64 degrees Fahrenheit at the depth of eight inches. This signals to the cicada that the world is now warm enough. Leaves will be on the trees. It'll be 70, 80 degrees. It will be warm enough for them to get up and out of the ground, climb up on the trees, shed their skins, escape predators, become adults, go into the treetops, join the big boy band. Remember, these are teenagers. They've been underground for 17 years. When they get up and out of the ground, they're gonna go wanna go party. There's gonna be music up in the treetops. There's gonna be women. They're gonna be courting. 64 degrees signals that it's time to get up and out. We'll begin to see this emergence from the soil, usually at dusk, as nightfall comes. This is probably a way to escape the hungry eyes of different types of predators. And if we go out, we'll see them making a jailbreak from their subterranean crypts. And yes, they do like Beethoven. Uh, you'll often hear Beethoven playing as they're emerging. No doubt about it. Once they've attained vertical structures, then they're gonna shed their exoskeleton or their nymphal skin. They'll attach to the trees. They've got little claws on their front legs to help them grip. There's gonna be a lot of cicadas. 
Hey, Mike, can you explain the holes again? If they did not emerge yet, how do they make them? They simply tunnel up. In other words, their front legs, let me get on this image right here. See these front legs? They're like little shovels. They're like spades. So what they do is they move the earth, they build a tunnel. They're basically tunneling up through the earth to make that hole. Because when the soil temperature hits 64, they have to get up and out. So the tunnel is created almost a full month in advance of when they're coming up. Remember, gang, they're, they're 18 inches underground feeding on roots. Somehow they have to get from 18 inches below up to the surface of the earth. The only way you do that is to build an escape tunnel. So what they've been doing for the last month is basically when the soil is moist, they will carve it and they will shape it and they will press it into a tunnel. So when the temperature hits 64 and everybody's escaping, making a jailbreak, they can get out of the earth. Does that explain it? Yes, yeah. thank you very much. You're welcome. Good question. So this is all done in advance of the big emergence. Once they're on the tree, their exoskeleton will split down the main line right here in the back. They will then contract their muscles, which causes their blood, their hemolymph to expand. They will pump up like Hans and Franz, and they will push themselves out of their exoskeleton. The adult will then hang backwards. Once she has her rear end out, she will lean forward, come all the way out, or he, and then they will pump blood into their wings to expand their wings. In my opinion, this is the point in time when cicadas are very beautiful. Uh, these are also soft shelled cicadas, and we'll talk about eating cicadas a little bit later. Looks like an action hero. It, they're very cool. Um, <laughs> So in a four to six day period, then the exoskeleton is going to begin to harden. Once that hardens, then they'll be able to fly, get up into the treetops, make their sounds and begin the courtship. And as I said before, there are going to be a lot of cicadas. Uh, th these are just some uh, perennials underneath a big old tree in uh, College Park. And it's not at all unusual to see literally hundreds of cicadas emerging from the ground overnight and molting and then working their way up to the treetops. They're not going to be feeding on these plants. They're just going to be shedding their skins. Okay, the adults live for two to four weeks. They also feed on the xylem fluid. Um, but because they're emerging over the span of a couple weeks, they're basically going to be with us for anywhere from probably six to eight weeks. We have already had the very first periodical cicada, as far as I know, in the entire United States, emerged just out of Towson, Maryland on April 19th. That's an extreme outlier. We'll talk more about the rest of the brood in just a few minutes. Once they're on the tree, they're going to head for the safety of the treetop. This will be a very common site uh, a little bit later in the uh, year. And uh, once they're up in the treetop, then uh, it's going to be all about romance. I often get a question, are there blue eyed cicadas and is there a reward if you find one? And the answer is yes and yes. They're purported to see be about one in a million. I see them all the time. Uh, there's a lot of variation in eye color, red, blue, orange, uh, you know, kind of a, a very pale uh, blue color here. But hey, I probably haven't seen a million, but I've seen thousands and I always see a blue eyed cicada. Now, your reward for finding a blue eyed cicada is that you have found a blue eyed cicada, which is very cool. There is no monetary reward. Let's talk about how they make their sounds. Uh, courtship and mating. It is only the males that make sound. However, both males and females can hear, okay? The songs are distinct to the different species. Remember, there are three species emerging at the same time. So what they have to do is they have to get with the correct members of their species to mate. So they will have very distinct songs 
to get everybody in the same place at the same time. The males will sing in the treetops. They're going to fly up to treetops. They're going to sing the loudest at the warmest part of sunny days on rainy days, cloudy days, cool days, not so much. But on bright sunny days in May and June, you'll hear them sing in the treetops. They have a special organ on the side of their abdomen. It's called the timbal organ. It's like a drum head. There are muscles attached to the timbal organ. They can vibrate the timbal to create sound. I'll give you a little listen as to what the timbal organ sounds like. No, we're not getting that. You're not getting it? Uh. Let me see if I can move the uh, microphone up a little bit more. Okay. Hold on. How about that? So. Yeah, that's better. Okay. By the way, no cicadas were harmed in the production of this uh, presentation. Um, <laughs> the abdomen is hollow and it acts as a reverberation chamber to amplify the sound. When they are up in the treetops, the sound of the periodical cicada chorus can reach 80 to 100 decibels. That's the sound of a lawnmower engine or a jet aircraft going overhead. They use this particular call is called the alarm call. So if a bird were to catch them or a bug geek, they would make that noise basically to try to frighten uh, the predator away. So here's again the alarm call. Let me see if I can make this be a little louder. That's good. Now, once they're in the treetops, they'll switch to their calling song and this Chorus basically gets the members of different species together in the same place. Everybody of the same species in the same place. So here's a typical calling song. Once everybody is together, males and females of the same species, they will go eyeball to eyeball. And then the male, it's going to be all about romance. And this is very romantic. He's going to use his very best performance to try to convince that special someone that she should be the mother of his nymphs. Here's what a courtship song sounds like. Does it for me? Uh, if she likes his performance, if he's the one, and if he's won her over, she's going to signify her acceptance by flicking her wings and making a little clicking sound like that. That's going to seal the deal. Then they are going to hook up. They're going to mate. And this is what they will look like. Again, the females can hear the males. They have an eardrum called a tympanum. And it will be we've got to switch the tune a little bit here. Uh, now it won't be at all surprising to see males and females in copula for long periods of time in the treetops. Uh, this particular um, shot I made was actually in a graveyard in Lorton. Uh, hey, romance happens everywhere. Uh, you can see the male was getting a little bit shy about the paparazzi being there. Um, you can tell the males from the females. Let me tone this down a little bit. The males will have a rounded abdomen. The females will have a pointy abdomen. This is what we call the ovipositor. And this is the appendage the female will use to put her, her eggs into the trees. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Once she has been fertilized, she'll move to small branches the size of my pinky. She will use her ovipositor to cut slits in these branches. 
She will then deposit 20 to 30 eggs in each egg nest, and she can lay from 400 to 600 eggs total. The eggs are going to mature in four to six, excuse me, six to 10 weeks. They're gonna tumble down to the ground, and then the small nymphs are gonna dig in. We'll look at those in a minute. Here you can see her ovipositor inserted into the egg nest, and she's pumping eggs through her ovipositor, filling up the egg nest. So that's what her pulsing abdomen is all about here. She's laying her eggs. After six or 10 weeks, the tiny nymphs the size of a grain of rice will hatch. They will tumble down to the earth, bounce twice, and then dig in and find small roots and begin to develop underground for 13 or 17 years. Oftentimes when I'm working in my garden, I will dig up periodical cicada nymphs. This is what they look like. This is one about halfway grown, probably been in the ground, maybe something like six or seven years. When will we see cicadas? Using data I collected last year from a citizen science app, I analyzed the data and published a paper. Here's a summary. The very first cicada out of the ground last year occurred just outside of Towson, Maryland on April 19th, almost exactly the same date in almost exactly the same place that we saw the first periodical cicada of 2021. They must be feeding them very good food up there. Or it must be a little bit warmer. We'll begin to see them trickle out during the first week of May. They will then crescendo reaching their peak emergence during the last two weeks of May. So by Memorial Day weekend, 75% of the cicadas will be out of the ground, up in the treetops, having a cicada palooza, having romance, uh, laying eggs and carrying on. And then as we move into June, by the second, third week of June, the last will have emerged. And by July 4th, all the cicadas for this year, the adults will be gone. These have been called poor defenseless species, never seen animals more entirely stupid. They're predator foolhardy. So periodical cicadas are not very clever at, at getting away from uh, predators. Here you can see a predatory stink bug, an animal that must be only one tenth the size of a periodical cicada subduing and killing it. It's got its beak inside the cicada feeding on its fluid. Birds are gonna love these things. We had a program recently, Mike, on uh, birds of Loudoun, and the speaker said, we're gonna see a lot more birds in May because of the cicadas. Yeah, birds are double, gonna double clutch this year. They'll lay maybe two batches of eggs. The, the fledglings are gonna do much better. Everything on the planet's gonna wanna eat cicadas. There'll be invertebrate predators like ants that are going to devour them. This one is trying to molt, and the carpenter ants are on the tree at nighttime feeding on it. Perhaps the most interesting natural enemy is actually a fungal disease. It's called Massospora cicadini. This one basically lays in wait for 13 or 17 years on the surface of the soil as a spore. When the Cicada emerges from the earth, the spore attaches to the skin of the cicada. It then penetrates its body, multiplies within, and turns the abdomen of the cicada into a fungus garden. The periodical cicada, its genitalia obviously are dysfunctional. This is a male. The males will still attempt to mate with females. So you'll see these male cicadas walking around the landscape with a big fungus body on their rear end. In some cases, in some cases, the abdomen will be almost completely gone. They will attempt to mate with females. And at this point in time, they will infect females. And now it becomes a sexually transmitted disease in the cicada population. Now, the most interesting part about Massospora is it can make the male cicada a zombie. It takes mind control of the male cicada and feminizes it. And here's how it works. 
Remember I told you before, when the female cicada really likes that guy and wants to mate, she's going to click her wings like this. What Massospora does is it makes a male cicada flick his wings. This attracts other males that attempt to mate with him, further spreading the Massospora fungus throughout the population of periodical cicadas. Now that's crazy. Creatures are going to eat cicadas, no doubt about it. Raccoons, foxes, squirrels, turtles, birds, uh, all kinds of creatures. Humans are going to eat cicadas. I certainly will be snacking on a few. You'll be able to buy cicadas and dine on them as a, as a delicacy. Good on top of a pizza. And dogs, too, right? Dogs, uh, dogs, like... dogs are going to love these things. We'll talk more about your dogs in just a minute, but yeah, they're going to love them. But the really cool thing here, their final act of contrition is when they die, they're going to rain down on the very plants from which they were spawned and fertilize those plants. Insects uh, like ants and other uh, basically insects in, involved in decomposition are going to feast on cicadas. So fundamentally, cicadas are little geniuses of transferring materials and energy up and down food webs. For 17 years, they take from the plant. In the 17th year, they give back to everything that wants to eat a cicada. And when they die, their little bodies are going to fertilize the very plants from which they were spawned. Trees will actually grow better in the years right after cicadas. In addition, these holes are going to go down a foot into the soil. They could be as many as 30 per square foot. They're going to last for several years. That's going to allow for tremendous soil aeration and water infiltration. So there's a lot of things that cicadas do. Now, so that kind of um, answers a question someone was asking. Do they destroy yeah. the plant and trees to which they're attached? Well, here we go with that one. Let's do okay. that. Remember the egg nests? They're going to attack more than 200 kinds of woody plants. As you can see, some of the very common ones in our landscapes. Now, what we know from scientific studies that mature established trees are going to basically walk right through this. There's going to be no long term effect. They're not going to have a reduction in radial growth or survival. After a few years, they'll be just fine. The trees we are worried about are these ones right here, small saplings. This tree will be fine. This tree will not be fine. Recently transplanted trees, small trees that have very open habits, lots of branches the size of my pinky, exactly what cicadas want, will be heavily damaged in areas where there are cicadas. Look in the background here at these locust and cherry trees, virtually no damage in the same habitat. This is what the cicadas want. When they lay their eggs, it will cause the branches to weaken and snap off or fly, creating that brown uh, appearance that we just saw. We call this flagging. What can you do? Well, you heard you could wrap them in mosquito netting or tree cloth or uh, cheesecloth. People have said put sticky bands on your trees. Well, don't do that because you could interrupt some cicadas. But remember, they're going to fly up to the treetops to the cicada palooza. They're going to mate. Then the females are going to fly to other trees to lay their eggs. So putting a band on this tree isn't going to stop the females from coming and laying eggs. So I don't think this is a good idea. You will find pesticides in uh, the big box stores that have cicadas on the label. Don't do that. Here's why. Several scientific studies, including studies of my own and studies by Henry Hogmeyer, clearly demonstrated that with young fruit trees, if you net trees with cicada netting, one centimeter mesh size, you can totally eliminate, almost totally eliminate cicada damage. If your net is 2.5 centimeters, about an inch, the cicadas can get through. And if it's five uh, centimeters, they're going to get through and lay eggs. This, in contrast, this contrasted with the multiple applications of 
synthetic pyrethroids and organophosphate pesticides every three days didn't keep cicadas off. So do not spray your trees with pesticides or hire somebody to come in and spray your trees with pesticides. You're gonna harm your beneficial insects, your pollinators, and you're not gonna stop the damage. I repeated this experiment with a neonicotinoid insecticide in 2006 and found exactly the same thing. My netted trees, no damage. My pesticide trees, damage. This is a typical netting, okay? It cost us back in 2006 about $6 of material. We could net a tree in about 20 minutes. Uh, there's a website that has, uh, I'll talk about in a minute, that has a six minute video that shows you how to net a tree to protect it. Again, your pesticides are not gonna be good for the beneficial insects and uh, the other creatures that live in your landscape. Now, some people have said netting can create problems. Birds are gonna get caught in it. Reptiles, snakes are gonna get caught in it. This is my experimental plot. There were 30 netted trees. I did not have a single tree where a bird got caught, a cicada got caught, or a reptile like a snake got caught. Obviously, if you have a bird nest in the tree, don't net the tree, right? But if you net it like this so creatures can't get up and inside the net, I think everything's going to be fine. Other things you can do. Don't let your pets eat too many, okay? Cats are going to love these things. Your golden retriever is gonna let eat buckets if you let it. Please don't do that. It's gonna cause, uh, too many cicadas will cause uh, digestive problems on either end, and you're, they're really gonna mess up your rugs in your house. So don't let them eat too many. A few is okay. You can skim your swimming pools, uh, otherwise they'll clog your filters. Eat some if you like. I certainly will be eating cicadas at some point in time. Uh, a few years ago, um, I had done a show, uh, part of the Today Show, and somehow Jay Leno's uh, producers saw some of my outtakes when I was clowning around. And I got a phone call from the producer, and she said, well, how would you like to come to California and see if you can get Jay Leno to eat a cicada? And I said, how can I resist? So I smuggled a couple dozen cicadas in my carry-on on Southwest out to California to Hollywood, um, where they were doing the shooting. And uh, I played the part of the scientist. This, the producer said, okay, look, um, offer some cicadas, eat one yourself, offer them to Jay and offer them to the other guests. I said, all right, I can do that. So I did the part of the show where I've just done with you and played uh, the scientist. And then uh, we came to the part of the show where Leno says, he says, well, Professor Rauch does uh, anything eat cicadas. And I said, sure, Jay, look at this. And we had about six cicadas lined up on a little skewer. They were roasted, they were seasoned, they looked pretty good. So I popped one in my mouth. I said, mm, they've got a buttery texture, you know, a nutty flavor. They're really good. And then I turned to offer one to uh, Jay Leno. The other guest that night happened to be Russell Crowe, who had just finished the Superman movie. So as I leaned over to offer one to uh, Leno, uh, Russell Crowe whispered it behind me, says, I'm not going to eat that, mate. So I pointed the uh, skewer at, at Jay and I said, Jay, I'll give you a dollar if you eat a cicada. He grabbed one, he popped it in his mouth and he said, these are better than Cheetos. And then he took the skewer and he pointed it at Russell Crowe and he said, Superman's father, like this. And Russell Crowe said, no thanks, mate. There are no cicadas on Krypton. So they're better than Cheetos. There aren't any on Krypton, but they're going to be some <laughs> in your backyard. So if you want a snack on cicadas, uh, I think that would be something interesting to try. Some people are going to fear cicadas, and I take this very seriously. I get it. The thing to do right now is try to learn as much about cicadas as you can. I'll give you some websites in just a minute. Understand they don't bite, they don't sting, they don't carry away dogs and small children like the monkeys in the Wizard of Oz. It's not gonna happen. If you're still struggling with this after you've learned about them and what they do, 
I suggest that you talk to a counselor, maybe seek, uh, you know, a professional who can help you understand this and try to find out what you're struggling with. And finally, if you can't take it, get out of town. No cicadas in Bethany. No cicadas in Virginia Beach. No cicadas in upstate New York. No cicadas in Florida. No cicadas in California. I've already recommended several people take that cicada vacation. Get out of town for a couple weeks. You're going to be okay. If you want to help the scientists, you can download this free app. It's called Cicada Safari. That data I showed you earlier about the emergence peak, this is data that I use from Cicada Safari. I published a paper on this earlier this year talking about using this data that citizen scientists collected. You're going to download it to your iPhone or your Android, snap a picture of the cicada. It's going to come back to us. We're going to vet that picture and we're going to know the geospatial where you took the picture and when. This is going to allow us to find out exactly where and when cicadas are emerging. It's going to be great for kids. It's going to be great thing to do with kids or just give them the iPhones. They know how to use them. If you want more information, you can go to our website. Right now, I'm teaching a course with my colleague, Dr. Shrewsbury, on scientific outreach using uh, periodical cicadas as a model. The students have called themselves the Cicada Crew. If you go to the Cicada Crew website, it's got frequently asked questions. It's got all kinds of resources and links. It's got pictures of cicadas you can use uh, for your uh, trainings or teaching. It's got my videos of cicadas, many of which you've seen tonight. Uh, and uh, it's also got merchandise. Uh, the students are funding their graduate studies by selling cicada t-shirts. We also have cicada onesies. We've got cicada masks. We've got cicada sweatshirts. So if you want to get in on the Brood uh, 10 Fun in 2021, go there. Cicada Mania is a wonderful website of all things cicadas. Uh, I use it almost on a daily basis. The University of Connecticut has a great website of research on cicadas. And the Audubon Naturalist Society, in cooperation with George Washington University, has a website called Friend to Cicadas, where they have lots of resources for school teachers. So visit this. You can also visit my blog, which is Bug of the Week. Any browser type in Bug of the Week. For the past month and for the next several weeks, I will be publishing studies and videos and pictures of what's going on with cicadas. You can also find the Cicada Crew on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So, gang, thanks for inviting me. I hope you've learned something about cicadas. Maybe you had a little fun tonight. Uh, I hope that everybody can get out and enjoy a spectacular natural phenomenon that only happens a handful of times in a lifetime. It is a fantastic opportunity to witness Mother Nature at her very best. Hey, it's going to have birth. It's going to have death. It's going to have intrigue. It's going to have romance. It's going to have crazy things going on. It's going to be better than an episode of Game of Thrones. So go outside. The weather's getting great. It's been a nasty year with COVID, social injustice, political shenanigans. This is a time to really go out and have some fun. So I hope you enjoy the periodical cicadas. Thanks so much, Mike. That was a lot of fun. And I can't wait to go out in my backyard and look at under the trees. Um, a couple of questions. If the sure. cicadas have this fungus on them, won't yeah. those cicadas harm animals that eat them? No. Uh, this is a specialist fungus that only attacks cicadas. Okay. Now, um, now whether a bird is going to get sick when it eats one, I, I can't promise you that. I've never seen data. I've never seen data on this, but my suspicion is is likely no. Uh, again, this is a highly specialized fungus. Okay. Um, this person is writing from the Midwest and is getting a new tree next week, about eight to ten feet tall. Would he or she need to net the tree? 
Well, if they're planning it in a place where there were cicadas in 2004, they certainly should consider it. If there were no cicadas in that landscape, then no, you're not going to have cicadas this time. So the first thing is to figure out if you had them 17 years ago. Answer no, you're okay. Answer yes, then it's going to be a personal choice. Um, certainly, if I had a valuable young tree, I actually, it's a little late now, but for the past six months, I've been recommending that people delay their planting till the fall planting season, which in my opinion is the very best time to plant trees, because then you don't have to worry about the midsummer drought and the heat in June, July, and August. By September, we have rain. If you've already put them in the ground or did last year uh, and you're worried and you had cicadas uh, 17 years ago, I think it's a good thing to just consider, but it is again, a personal choice. Okay, give us the size again on the trees that should be netted. At what I, point I will, are you okay? Yeah, I, I planted would. a river birch last year. I'm just wondering. <laughs> Well, look, gang, uh, look, don't go nuts. I don't want you guys climbing up ladders and falling off and breaking your ankles. So obviously small trees like this are going to be easy uh, to net. I've seen trees in Chicago uh, back in 2006 when they had their big uh, emergence out there. I saw people netting 15 foot tall trees. So it really is a personal choice what you want to do. Uh, I can't tell you what the minimum or maximum size is, but I don't want you to do anything that might put you at harm. So <laughs> obviously young trees like this are going to be easy to do. Uh, a 15 foot tall tree. I mean, that tree is probably that is close to 15 feet. And that yeah. one is that one may or may not survive. Uh, I talked to several nursery growers back in 04 who planted fields full of trees. The cicadas came and wiped out entire fields full of trees. So uh -huh. I'm just telling you what happened. Uh, this has got to be your decision what you want to do. But again, this would be a pretty tough one to net, I think. But you can see what the cicadas have done to that tree. So I'm I'm just trying to give you the facts, ma'am. Uh, it's okay. Gonna be, it's gonna be your choice. Thank you. Yep. Is Cicada Safari linked with the iNaturalist app? No, it they're in the, they're independent. They're both collecting data, but Cicada Safari was specifically developed for this, and it's it's all formatted right now, so scientists can get, uh, you know, directly get a, a huge data set and rapidly analyze it uh, as I did to present that graphic I showed you. iNaturalist is wonderful and we're collecting iNaturalist data as well. But, you know, this is just a very fun, easy to use app uh, as well. You can do either, but this one will pipeline directly into the scientists that are trying to map um, the distribution of cicadas. Uh, but sure, I iNaturalist is also a really good uh, you know, uh, kind of crowdsourcing uh, way to collect data too. Um, isn't a problem that someone covered the holes with peat moss? No, they'll find their way through. Yeah, I mulch my beds to the typical depth of about an inch or two, and the cicadas will find their way right out of there. They're they're ready to go. They'll, okay. they'll do it. Yep. Any reason to hold off pruning trees right now? I don't think so. In fact, uh, the other strategy here is you can wait and let them lay their eggs and your trees will heal quicker. Of course, if you prune off the wound, uh, some of those wounds will stick with the trees. Uh, I have a tree across the street, a maple tree that was damaged uh, 17 years ago, and it's still showing big galls and knotty growths along the branches. So if you prune the, uh, the damage out, the tree will heal much faster. Again, when you prune, you always prune back to the next node. So, you know, if you've got a node here and a node here and the eggs are here, don't prune here, prune back to your next node. So the axillary meristems can seal off the wound and then grow, right? So don't prune in the middle of a long branch is what I'm telling you. Okay. Yeah. What's your favorite cicada recipe? Oh my God. Uh, well, really, to tell you the truth, if I want to find out what the cicada tastes like, I'm going to eat a soft-shelled cicada. Uh, <laughs> again, I've been challenged several times by reporters. You may know Michelle Miller. Uh, she now anchors, I think, the morning show on CBS. 
Uh, she and I did a, a, sh a shtick out in Chicago, and same thing. I was doing the scientist, and there were cicadas next to me on the tree. And she said, well, Professor Rapp, does anything eat cicadas? And I said, yeah. She said, have you eaten cicadas? I said, sure. She said, well, would you eat a cicada right now? And I said, of course I would. So I reached over, and I grabbed one. I popped it in my mouth. I said, hmm, this is really good. And then I grabbed another one. I said, would you like one? And we kind of cut the, the tape there. That didn't make it off the cutting room floor. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, if you want to find out, I mean, if you've eaten a, a, a clam, a raw clam, a raw oyster, you know, a clam or an oyster, let's face it, gang, they're at the bottom of a bay and they're filtering you know what out of the water. This creature has spent 17 years underground sipping plant sap. So in terms of, you know, things you eat, uh, I think this is okay. If you're going to eat fresh ones or soft shells, what I recommend doing is to find one. Several of them will get stuck in their exoskeleton. The mortality on the first night is huge. There'll be several that fall to the ground. Simply find one of those that isn't going to survive and you can just pop it in your mouth and eat it. If you're going to eat cicadas, there are two things to keep in mind. Number one, is that if you have an allergy to shrimp or prawns, don't eat cicadas. It's the same allergen in the exoskeleton, and you may have a reaction. Number two, if you're going to eat cicadas, I recommend that rather than throw them in a pot of boiling water like a lobster and listen to them scream, put them in the freezer or the refrigerator for a little while before you, you blanch them and use them in your recipe. One of my favorites is called the emergence cookie. Uh, basically, it's like a chocolate chocolate chip. Uh, you take your cicada nymph and you put it on the top and then you bake it right after it's been blanched. And then you can eat the cookie, but you save the nymph for last, just like an Oreo. Uh, another good recipe you'll find in the Cicada Licious cookbook um, is the uh, they're called the chirper taco. And gang, you know, if you put uh, if you put anything in a taco with some seasoning, uh, it's gonna taste really, really good. Um, I've got a browser open. I'm gonna see if I can kick you over here uh, just for the heck of it, and we'll see if we can bring up and I'll I'll help you find the way. So here's our Cicada Crew website. If you click on resources and you scroll down. You'll be able to see uh, many videos that we have, uh, other resource pages. But if you go all the way down here to recipes, you can click, click on the Cicadalicious cookbook. It was created by one of our last crop of graduate students, Janet Jaden. It became a bestseller. And it's chock a block full of interesting recipes. Here's soft shelled cicadas, Shanghai cicadas, dumplings. Uh, one of my favorites, uh, stir fries are always good. You can make the El Chirper tacos really good. So, you know, it's a delicacy. Try it. Um, I mean, in other parts of the world, uh, bugs are definitely on the menu. We seem to have an aversion to this in Western culture. I'm not sure why, but yeah, they're going to be uh, interesting and uh, and kind of good to eat. So I will be snacking uh, on these. No doubt about it. Okay, someone wrote in. Hold on a second. Do they lay eggs in wood, woody sh shrubbery? We yep. had pruned a flowering bush last fall, and I'm wondering if it will be stressed and not survive the cicadas. Yeah, if you have small bushes, woody stems, sure. I've seen them uh, in many different types of woody shrubs. So, yes, especially when the densities are high, trees are going to be preferred. But there's no question uh, that they will lay their eggs in small shrubs as well. So, uh, yeah, that that is going to happen. And uh, again, if you heavily pruned one, you might want to consider it should be easy to net, right? If it's a small shrub, uh, should not be a problem to net that thing. OK, um, one more question. And can you also put your first slide up so people can see your website and. Yeah, maybe. Uh, Oh, okay. I'm going to have to. No, it's okay. I think I, I think I can do this. Okay. And uh, how can they not harm the tree for the 17 years damage they do to the roots? I, I never said they didn't harm the tree. 
Uh, oh. <laughs> now, obviously, no, man, when they're underground and they're feeding on plant, uh, on plant sap, they're taking from the tree. Remember I said for 17 years, they take from the tree. Right. So that, yeah, they're draining the sap out of that tree, but again, then they're going to give it back. Uh, later in a different way, but sure. So yeah, that that's a burden on the tree, no question about it. So no confusion here. I've also heard people say, I've read in, in garden magazines, oh, the cicadas prune trees, it's natural pruning. Well, that tree doesn't like that. I mean, come on, gang, uh -huh. give, give me a break. Do you think, do you think that tree likes that? I don't right, think right. so. So don't believe, uh, that they're naturally pruning and not harming trees. That's absolutely not the case, right? But the trees well, they, were, yeah, go ahead. Will they affect the tick population in any way? The tick population? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. That's a pretty interesting question. And uh, it's a little bit deeper than you might think. So whenever we have like, a, a, do you guys know what a mast year is in oak trees, for example? Uh, oaks don't always produce the same number of acorns. Periodically, they'll produce vast numbers of acorns and other years, very few. The years they produce mast, uh, what will happen is one year downstream, because there's a super abundant resource, things like small rodents, like the white-footed mouse, which is the reservoir host for the Lyme disease agent, Borrelia burgdorferi, their populations will increase. And research done up in New York indicates that when mice populations go up, the incidence of Lyme disease goes up. I have not seen a paper on this, and I've not seen a published account, but I would imagine because many small rodents, including things like white-footed mice, will be dining on cicadas, they may have the same effect on uh, these small rodents increasing fecundity and survival. So in theory, two years downstream, we might expect to see more ticks uh, two years after a cicada emergence. Now, this is raw speculation on my part, but the other, um, thing about the acorns I talked about has is published science. So it could have an effect. We really don't know. We'll just have to wait and see, I guess. Interesting. Yeah, it's got to have some effect, right? Everything affects everything. Oh, yeah, we're all tied together. That's <laughs> right. We sure are. Yep. OK, any more questions before we leave today? Thank you all for joining us and for learning more about cicadas. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure to be in your homes and, uh, you know, try to get out and enjoy this thing. It's, uh, it's, you know, just a, a few handful of times in a lifetime, you're going to see this spectacle and it's, it is simply going to be spectacular. So don't fear the cicada, enjoy the cicada. It's one of mother nature's grandest and most special events. Uh, so. You don't have to travel to uh, Botswana or Tanzania to go on a safari. Right. You can go right in your own backyard and have a cicada safari this year. It's going to be fun. enough excitement happening right in your backyard this yep. year. Thank you again, Mike. Okay, my Appreciate pleasure, Lorraine. It. Thanks so much for having me. Have a good sure. evening. Sure. Yep. Hold, hold on just a second, okay? Sure. And thank yep. you again all for joining us. My pleasure.